this video introduces aspects of the rocks that we find on faults and the structure of fault zones. We'll look at how faults relate to deformation through the crust as a whole. We'll then look at the types of fault rocks, some structure of fault zones, and then some detail of rather special types of rocks that we find on faults and associated with fault zones. So faults, of course, are often shown as single lines on cross sections. As you go down deeper in the crust, they can broaden out into zones of more dispersed deformation or shear zones. This change in deformation with depth is shown in this idealized cartoon, which shows the idea that at depth, the deformation is governed by plastic and viscous behaviors and generates materials looking like this where the rocks are streaked out and the deformation under these conditions is dependent on the temperature. In contrast, the upper crust is characterized by frictional processes, deformation that is pressure sensitive, and we get these highly shattered rocks where grain size is reduced by breaking. And we call these rather special types of rocks cataclasites. The most obvious are breccias, angular rock fragments found along fault planes. But when the deformation continues, these breaches can become ground down into a rock flower, and we call these highly processed materials gouge. So let's see how this works. We're going to look at some fault zones in fully lithified rocks where there's no real original porosity. And here's a fault plane from up on the north coast of Scotland that juxtaposes younger Cambrian quartzites on the left against old gneisses on the right. It's a normal fault. There it goes, down throwing towards the left. Let's zoom in to the fault zone itself up here. Here we are, there's a compass there for scale and the sense of movement is shown running down to the left, down throwing the quartzites against the gneiss. But if you look at the, the texture in there, it's really quite complicated. Let's start off in the gneiss. So away from the fault plane, the gneiss is fractured. It's actually a pegmatitic gneiss. You can see the pink felspars and so forth. It's fairly fractured in that photograph, coin for scale. As we come closer in, there's another coin for scale there. We can see that the rocks get a bit streaked out. And in this position, right against the fault plane, the, you'd hardly know that was a nice original at all. It's a ground up rock flower, a gouge. So we have a zone of processing from more intact rock into increasingly grain size reduced gouge as we approach the fault plane. Look what's happening to the quartzites above. They too are shattered and we have this rather remarkable breccia. So the fault is not in detail a single plane, but it's represented by a slip surface with a halo of fracture damage, both in the hanging wall and in the foot wall which processes those rocks eventually into a gouge along which slip has occurred. So we have some terminology now of classic fault zone architecture. The main slip zone is called the fault core, where the rock is barely recognisable from its original state. And a zone of fracture damage around the fault zone called the damage zone. Let's look at another example of fully lithified material. It's uh, they're limestones uh, from southwest Wales with the fault core in the middle of the photograph there with the compass sat on it and shattered limestones on both sides of the fault. It's a strike slip fault zone, very steep structure. We have the fault core and the damage zone. Let's go and have a look in close up. Here's the fault core. Lots of angular fragments, lots of uh, fine grain material in here. The damage zone is rather different really. You can still see the fracture damage, but you can almost jigsaw these pieces together again to still see the layering in the limestones. So the halo of damage with lots of uh, fracturing, not much offset. So when we're looking at damage in lithified rocks, you get a slightly different type of material behavior when we look at faulting in porous materials such as these porous sandstones. A really great example is here on the Moray coast in some dune sandstone. Well, the way in which this porous material deforms is through the features called deformation bands, which are micro faults. 
we can look at them in close up in here and we can see that we've got these little seams running through the outcrop in here, little micro faults called deformation bands right adjacent to the main fault core where they, again you have a gouge and a smashed up, highly smashed up grains along the fault core itself. There are different ways in which deformation bands can develop. In the examples that we're looking at here, the grains themselves are breaking in narrow bands. But in other situations, particularly in shallow areas, the grains simply repack so you get a deformation band forming just where porosity has collapsed. Here's a, another example of deformation band behavior from New Zealand in turbidite sandstones. We can see the small scale faulting in here. If we zoom in in a bit more detail again, you can see these small seams where the uh, grains are repacked into these little deformation bands from these very diffuse small uh, micro faults. And again, in this thicker bed down at the bottom here, you can see the same sort of feature. The main diagonal fault running across there, and then a halo of smaller little micro faults forming a damage zone around the main fault. Another feature you get in these sorts of rocks is the finer grain materials, the, uh, in this case some mudstones, are smeared out along the fault plane like this, so sheared out along the fault. This is called clay smear. Well, a feature of deformation bands is they very rarely come on their own. They form these swarms, as you can see in this example from these uh, Miocene sandstones from Sicily, forming this web of deformation bands. So it seems that the act of faulting in these porous sandstones is not to localise the deformation so much, but to spread it out through time. And we can think of this working through a simple work hardening fashion. So let's see how that works. You have a little bit of slip and then it locks up, causing the adjacent rocks to fall continuously like this. So we get an array of deformation bands. In reality, they'll form a web rather than a series of cartooned parallel lines. But we end up with a halo of zone of deformation bands formed by this repacking process. It's an example of work hardening. But we're also messing around with the porosity in our fault zone in here. So if we zoom in on one of these deformation bands from Sicily, here it is in thin section, five centimetres across there, you can see the grain breaking, or the products of grain breaking with all these angular fragments running between the two arrows. The deformation band runs vertically through there, and that black colouring in the middle of it is iron staining because of iron mineralisation in the deformation band itself. So faults are commonly mineralised. Here's an example from uh, South Wales in limestones, and you can see that bright white calcite vein running along a fault plane. Here's a really famous example from New Zealand, where the host rocks are grey wackies, which are highly lithified former turbidite sandstones. Let's put the faults on. They form conjugate sets like this. So here's Rick Sipson at the outcrop describing how we can infer the stress situation by which these faults developed, where we have sigma 1 bisecting the conjugate faults, sigma 3 oriented perpendicular to that. So these fault systems are forming due to horizontal contraction. If we zoom in, we can see the vein arrays. We can put the stress regime in here. So pervasive fracturing forming quartz veins. Let's have a look at an example here from the French Alps. This is in limestones this time, and we can see the fault surface overhanging the outcrop, and on the face with the coin, we can see pervasive veining with those slightly greyer zones in there, which are calcite veins. So we're getting mineralization in the damage zone. But what about the fault surface itself? Let's look at a rather special type which are these so-called shear fibres, and we'll do this through a block diagram. So here we have a fault plane uh, which has carried pink rocks on top of green. Let's take away the hanging wall, and we can see that our fault plane's got a step on it. If we move the fault up like this, you can see that the step is put into contraction, and it's going to get ground away. This step, fancy word for that is an asperity, it's being ground down to make fault rock, fault gouge. But if we move the other way, we create a cavity, and in that cavity, we can precipitate new material. 
keep doing it, and this mineralization increases in its length down the fault plane, creating a fibrous pattern. Let's keep doing this. Here we are exposing the fibers, and let's look down. So we can see that the minerals have grown out in the direction that the fault has moved, aligned parallel to the striations, the mechanical abrasions on the fault surface. So if we move our route down the fault plane, carefully staying on the same slip surface, we move off the fault plane itself with its striations onto the new fibrous minerals. That's giving us a sense of slip. The fibres are growing on the lee side of that step. So we can see in the case that we got in the cartoon, it's a normal fault. So shear fibres are really important for telling us the sense of movement on fault surfaces. OK, so let's move upscale. We've been looking at faulting in the upper crust in here, in the frictional regime. As we go down in the crust, the stress increases. So earthquakes tend to occur where the rocks are strongest, where they, where they let out more energy when they break at the base of the frictional regime and you can get some really spectacular and dramatic rocks in these situations. The types of rocks that form during large earthquakes generate melt, so-called pseudotacolites. Here's an example here from the Outer Isles Fault in uh, the Outer Hebrides and it shows this idea that you've got the black glass in here forming along the fault plane and injecting fractures. Here we can see these pseudotacolites inject into the co-seismic fault breccias, generating these really spectacular brecciated rock. So this black material was once glass, formed by rapid frictional melting and then really rapid cooling as the frictional heat is rapidly dissipated. Pseudotacolites then, evidence for fossil earthquakes. So we've seen then that fault zones are actually quite complicated. They've got an array of different rock types, cataclysites formed by rock fracture. These are arranged into specific parts of a fault zone, the fault core where most of the slip is accommodated, and a damage zone where the deformation may be pervasive but is not particularly intense in terms of magnitude. We can sort of jigsaw the rocks together in many cases. We can see that in porous materials, the fault process can lead to grain disaggregation and for clay material can be smeared out along the fault plane. Fracturing is creating fracture porosity, and that can be a home for mineralization, and that mineralization could occur actively during the fault slip and provide us with indications of the sense of movement on faults, a really useful thing to find out. Finally, we saw how earthquake faulting and the frictional heat generated on fast moving faults can melt the rocks, creating pseudotacolites that can back inject into the co seismic breccias. So, an array of structures in fault zones. These variations of structures reflect different rock types, the burial conditions, the fluids on faults, and finally, the slip rate on fault planes themselves.